All right, so let me get this straight, says Mr. Sphinx. My boss has on a fuzzy violet bathrobe, a pair of matching slippers, and nothing else. If you saw him, you might think that he just rolled out of bed to deal with us, but this was what he always wears. Anyone who worked for him knows catching a glimpse of those wrinkled old man globes hanging between his legs is just a hazard of the job. Also, he's a homicidal maniac. That's a hazard, too. I'm tied up in an office so gaudy, it looks like the interior decorator shoved a live grenade up Prince's ass and called it a day. Bound to a chair on the other side of the mahogany conference table between us is my friend Ty. He hacks and snorts, conjuring as much phlegm as he can from the back of his throat, then spits a wad directly at my face. We're not on the best of terms at the moment. The loogie catches my chin and dribbles down my shirt. He grimaces at me through a pair of hateful eyes. One of them is black and swollen. He's been roughed up pretty good. They both have. I wonder which one of us looks worse. We're in the basement of Sphinx's underground casino. I've only been down to this level a couple of times, but it always makes me uneasy. Usually, I'm upstairs working as a car dealer. It's a lot less stressful on the casino floor. Not as much murder goes on up there. A revolver with polished gold side plates and an engraved ivory handle dangles casually in Sphinx's hand as he lectures us. I pray that it would accidentally go off while he's pointing it in my face, that I'd be spared the sound of his smug little voice. Both of you have been in my employ for, what, five years? Sphinx says. And all this time, you've been stealing from me. The missing chips here, a fudge of the books there. You were careful enough to take only little things no one noticed, but over time, it added up to a nice lump sum. Tens of thousands of dollars. I bet you thought you were pretty clever, huh? Well, you were. I was never going to catch you. He stops to unscrew a vial hanging around his neck. The only thing Sphinx likes more than gloating is the rush he gets from all the junk that goes up his nose. He sprinkled some powder from the vial along the barrel of his gun, then has at it like an enthusiastic truffle pig. His head snaps back after he finishes his line as though he'd been zapped with a thousand volts of electricity, and he gawks at us through a pair of big doe eyes. A few seconds later, he joins us back in the real world. How was I? He muttered. All right. Things were going great until Big Dick Herman gives Ty's girl the old in and out. Dog, Herm. He shoots a wink my way. And Ty, little snake that he is, decides to frame the whole operation on Herm to get revenge. Like, really, Ty? Did you not think I'd have someone else look into the books you two have been cooking after you ratted out your pal? Let me think, just a few days ago, you guys were on top of the world. The door opens, and I can hear the faint jingle and clatter of slot machines upstairs. In walks two of Sphinx's goons, carrying a roulette wheel they pulled from the casino floor. They place it on the table between Ty and myself, then exit the room without a word. Sphinx leans over and gives the wheel a spin. My, 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 how the tables have turned. I glance around the room, looking for an exit. But all I see are zebra print tapestries and velour curtains. This place is one heart-shaped bed and a few cum stains away from looking like some shady roadside love motel. On second thought, it probably has enough cum stains. But Sphinx was at least smart enough not to install black lights. Even if there was a way out, I'd still need to somehow get free of my restraints. My wrists are fastened tight with rope to the chair I'm sitting in, and my ankles are bound together to keep my legs from moving. I'm not going anywhere. Oh, Dr. Lunk! In walks a man I strongly suspect never went to medical school. He's six foot eight, if he's an inch and well over 300 pounds. He communicates in grunts, and there's a scar that runs all the way down the left side of his face, but that isn't even the most ominous thing about him. His lab coat would carry that honor. It's covered front and back in reddish-brown stains. I try to reassure myself that it's ketchup, and that Lunk is just a messy eater, but deep down I know that's wishful thinking. Here's the deal, Sphinx says. He waves his gun at us to make a point. I'm only going to kill one of you guys. How do you plan on doing that? asked Ty. You gonna make us stare at those shriveled little raisins you keep flashing us until one of us blows our brains out? Sphinx clicks his tongue. Ty's quip got under his skin, and that makes me start laughing. I can't control myself. 
Maybe it's the hopelessness of the situation. Maybe it's the last little bit of serotonin flushing itself from my brain before my body's filled with agony. Whatever the reason, the laughs flow from my mouth like a broken faucet, and I can't shut them off. Dr. Lunk leans over and clocks me. His fist feels like a sledgehammer, but it fixes the leak. I was actually thinking we'd play a little game of roulette. Sphinx gestures to the table. I'm going to spin the wheel ten times. Each spin correspond to a different body part that the good doctor here is going to amputate, mutilate, or grind to a pulp. Ty, you'll be red. Herman, you'll be black. If the ball lands on red after I spin this wheel, Ty, Dr. Lunk's going to remove your right index finger. If it lands on black, then, Herm, my good man, I hope you learn to shoot with your left hand. Whichever one of you has the most body parts at the end gets to work for me until you've paid back every penny that you stole. The loser, well, <laughs> he aims the gun at me and mouths the word, bang. Sphinx leans across the table and spins the wheel. While every eye in the room is focused on the ball, I'm fidgeting to get myself untied. I twist and I turn my wrists, push and pull my arms, struggle until my biceps burn and the veins bulge in my forearms, but it's no use. The ropes are too tight and I can't slip free of them. I turn my attention back to the table. The ball rattles around the track, bouncing from pocket to pocket, and for a second I think... God's playing some sort of cosmic joke. That the wheel's revolutions will never cease, and that the four of us are trapped in the moment, doomed to watch it spin for an eternity. This, however, is not to be. And if God is playing a joke, then I'm the punchline. Eventually, the ball does stop, and when it does, it's resting on 13 black. Sphinx is gleaming. Yep, first term. You think it'll be hard to shuffle cards with nine fingers? I buck in my chair, but Lunk is able to subdue me easily. He wraps his meaty paw around my right wrist to prevent me from moving it. With his free hand, he takes a pair of shears out of his pocket. Carefully, he manipulates my digits until my finger is between the blades. No, 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 I stammer. He doesn't listen to my pleas. A second later, the blades close around my index finger. It happens fast but I feel every moment of the steel slicing through my skin, severing my tendons and crushing my bones. An inferno of pain burns white hot from my wrist all the way to my fingernails, and I hear myself scream. When Lunk opens the scissors again, my finger is dangling, a few sinew strands of flesh still attached to my knuckle. He cleans me up with a second snip, and this time the finger falls to the floor. My body shudders and I let out a groan as blood begins to seep from the nub. Sphinx breaks out into laughter. Oh, calm down, you drama queen. And when he says this, he flops onto a violet chase at the end of the room. It's just a finger. You can't pick your nose and scratch your ass at the same time. It's not the end of the world. Sphinx snags a phone off the table beside him. Karina, my darling, he says into it. Your presence is requested in the office. The woman who answers his call is wearing a skin-tight leather bodysuit and fishnets. She's built like a telephone pole, tall and lean with her hair pulled back into a tight blonde ponytail. Her face is still, cheekbones sharp, as if rendered in a video game, but her lips are so plump she looks like she had an allergic reaction to a bee sting. She struts up to Sphinx, then sits gracefully in his lap. He strokes her cheek with the back of his hand, and if it wasn't for the Botox paralyzing her face... I'm sure she would have cringed. The strange woman then presents her neck to him like one of Dracula's victims, and within seconds, he's doing blow off of it. When he's done, he smiles to us. You like her? I want her in Moscow at a poker game. Got her off an arms dealer. Wanted in 48 countries. She doesn't speak any English. She understands it perfectly. Plus, she makes one hell of a... He licks his lips. Sex on the beach. I groan again, but I'm not sure if it's from the pain or secondhand embarrassment. As a matter of fact, he says to Karina, I could go for one of those right now. She rises to her feet. He pats her on the butt as she catwalks out of the room. You're down 1-0, Herman. Don't want to fall too far behind. He grabs hold of the wheel, but I call out before he has a chance to spin it. Wait, I said. That's enough. I'm done with this stupid game. Just let Ty go. The whole thing. 
This whole thing ripping you off, it was all my idea anyway. I can't believe I'm saying this, and Ty looks just as surprised as I am. I think the guilt has caught up to me. Fooling around with your buddy's girl is a scumbag move. But even more importantly, I don't want to see Ty go through what I just did. Despite the drama between us, we've been through too much together, and I still love him like a brother. If one of us has to take the heat, might as well be me. Sphinx slams a fist down on the table. That's not how it works. It's weird watching a 61-year-old man throw a tantrum. If I let one of you go, then there's no point in playing the game. He grips the wheel and gives it a rip. Sphinx has time to do another bump off his gun as the ball rolls around. When it stops, it rests on seven. Red. Lucky number seven, he shouts. It's Ty's turn. Dr. Lunk lumbers over to him, scissors in hand. Ty jerks his body defiantly in his chair, but Lunk wraps his catcher's mitt-sized hand around his face and keeps his head stable enough to slide one of the scissors' blades up his nose. The muscles in my neck tense when I see what he's doing. There's an uncomfortable pause as Lunk allows time for Ty to think about what's about to happen. Then the scissors snip shut. The blades split his nostril in two. Ty grunts. His face snaps back and he curses under his breath. A ruby red stream trickles down his face. The door opens and in struts Karina, carrying an orange cocktail and a hurricane glass. Sphinx takes the drink, picks a cherry out of the glass, pops it in his mouth, and frowns. This isn't a maraschino cherry. Before she can say anything, he chucks the glass. It shatters against the wall and frosty orange slush spatters everywhere. Make it again! Use the damn maraschino cherries this time! She turns to leave, but before she can, his hand springs out and snatches her around the arm. His face softens, as does his tone. Would the lovely lady care to spin the wheel before she goes? He asks. It's more of a command than a question, so Karina takes her turn at the wheel without objection. She watches in silence as the ball rolls around the track, and I wonder what's going on behind those cold, dead eyes of hers. When it finally stops, the ball is resting on 18 red. Ties up again. Herman, it's 2-1 now. You're mounting a comeback, cheers Sphinx. He waves at Dr. Lunk to get his attention. It's allow Karina to get in on the fun this time. The behemoth does as Sphinx requests and places the scissors in her slender hands. Karina sashays up to Ty and then extends a long leg over his thighs, straddling him. She points the scissors towards his belt buckle, teases and prods his groin, then runs them slowly up the front of his body. The scissors stop when they reach Ty's neckline, and one of the blades finds its way inside the collar of his shirt. In a flash, she slices upwards, tearing the shirt open and exposing his bare chest. I feel like I'm watching some kind of fucked up burlesque act. She leans forward, her red pouty lips just inches from Ty's, as she draws circles on his chest with her finger. Strangely sensual. Until... it's not until her hand shoots out like the head of a viper and clamps onto his nipple. She twists, Ty grimaces, but the pain on his face receives no sympathy from her. She begins to pull. I wince as I watch it stretch for a couple inches from his chest, then a couple more. It turns from pink to red to purple as blood vessels burst beneath the skin. Karina doesn't stop. She relentlessly pulls and yanks on it without any ounce of remorse. Ty's nipple is starting to look like saltwater taffy, and I wonder how much more give it even has before she tears it clean off. And just when I think it can't possibly stretch any further, the scissors slice upward. The movement is lightning quick, and by the time the blades have closed, Ty's nipple has been completely severed from his body. He lets out a surprised yelp and grinds his teeth as the pain settles in. Blood pours down his chest, much more than I would have expected. Everyone in the room watches in awe as Karina removes herself from Ty's lap. She hands Sphinx the pink rubbery trophy, which is somehow now reverted back to its original size, and then exits the room. Well, oh, that was kinky, says Sphinx. He strolls up to Ty and slaps him on the forehead. When he removes his hand, the nipples stuck between his eyes like a unicorn horn. I struggle again in my restraints, blood dribbling from the stump of my index finger to my wrist, and I try to use it to grease my way out of the ropes. I twist and rotate my hand, but all I manage to do is give myself a gnarly rope burn. How about we go for a thumb next? Sphinx grins. He spins the wheel again. I'm starting to hate the sound of that ball rattling around the track. 
It's maddening. When the ball stops, it does so on black. I don't even know what number. Doesn't matter anyway. It's my turn again, and Sphinx looks elated by this fact. You just lost your right index finger. Now you're going to lose a thumb. How are you supposed to jack off, Herman? Lunk latches onto my wrist. I'm too tired for fighting with the ropes to mount any sort of resistance. I catch a glimpse of the crimson-faced shears and get a little woozy when I realize that at least some of the blood on those blades is mine. He goes to work on the base of my thumb, really digging into the meat of my hand. The sharpened edges sink deep into my muscle, lighting up my pain receptors like the sky on the 4th of July. The thumb doesn't come off as easy as my index finger did. Now this time, Monk has to chew it from my hand with his scissors. He opens and closes the shears dozens of times, making mincemeat out of my flesh. It takes a minute, but eventually he grinds through it. By the time he's finished, I'm sweating through my shirt. Weirdly enough, it feels like my thumb's still attached to my hand. Weirdly enough, it feels like my thumb's still attached to my hand, but that a colony of fire ants has swarmed it. The stinging sensation is both confusing and excruciating at the same time. The wound bleeds worse than the index finger did. It gushes to the floor in heavy spurts, leaking all over the shag carpeting at my feet. I find at least some solace in the fact that I've ruined the hideous rug. Every nerve in my body is screaming, and now my vision is fading in and out. <laughs> Such a pussy. Ty growls. For a second I think he's talking to me, but when I glance up he's staring right at Sphinx. Flash your gun around and act like a tough guy, but at the end of the day, you have your goons do all your dirty work for you. Is that what you think? Sphinx is sneering. It's like I'm watching his conversation from the other side of a tunnel. My body is wrecked. Sphinx puts the gun down on the table in front of me. I try to reach for it momentarily, forgetting my arms are tied to the chair, but I'm reminded very quickly of that when they don't budge. Sphinx demands Lunk hand him the scissors. Why don't I give it a go on its next turn? He says. He says some other stuff too, but it sounds like he's underwater. My vision goes black and my chin sinks to my chest. When the world comes back into focus, the first thing I notice is the gun still sitting on the table, taunting me. If only I could grab it, I would end this lunacy. I hear Ty screaming next, then a guffaw from Sphinx. That's enough to get me to start squirming in my seat. I once again work on pulling myself free from the ropes. There's smoke in the air. I can smell the tobacco. Sphinx has a cigar in his mouth now, something ludicrously priced, knowing him rolled by the soft and supple hands of Cuban's purest virgins. I'm not sure how much time I've lost, but before I'm able to dwell on that, I feel something that makes me almost shout with glee. My hand slid backwards, more than it had before. I found some space, and I look down, I realize why. The missing thumb and index finger have given me just enough clearance to slip what's left of my hand free of the restraints. I think about reaching for the gun, but hesitate. I only have three fingers. I don't know if I could even cock the hammer on the thing, much less aim it. Before I have the opportunity to try, Sphinx and his pet gorilla turn around. I slide my hand back between the ropes so they don't notice. My heart sinks. I just missed my chance to get out of here. Sphinx is holding Ty's ear. Guessing that's what all the screaming's been about. He notices I'm conscious again. How's your little nap, Herm? Any bad dreams? Tell me about it. Happy to lend an ear. He flips the ear in my face. It smacks me in the cheek, then lands on the floor. I don't know what's taking that girl so long, he says to Lunk. I want my drink. The goon leaves the room. It's just the three of us when Sphinx spins the wheel again. You know, the sad part about this is I actually liked you guys, he says. That's funny. I never liked you, I spat back. Yeah, you pay like shit, says Ty. Why did you think we decided to steal from you? And just shave your head already, I said. Everyone could tell you're going bald. Sphinx fakes laughs. He runs his fingers through his thinning white hair on top of his head as he puffs his cigar. For once, he's at a loss for words. There's a glint of anger in his eyes that he's trying hard to suppress. Even in his 60s, he desperately wants to look cool, and I think we heard his feelings. Lunk returns by the time the ball stops. It's resting on nine. Black. My stomach twists itself into a knot. It needed to be red this time. 
There's no way I can get my hand on that gun with these two hovering over me. We're going to be pulling teeth, Sphinx says coldly. Anyone who's been on the same room as you already knows what that feels like. I fire back. Lunk removes a pair of pliers from his pocket, but Sphinx waves him off. No, he says. Scissors will do. He takes his time as he approaches, blood smeared across his bathrobe, a deranged look on his face. From behind me, I feel Lunk's hand wrap around my head. Sphinx leans over me. Open wide, he says. I keep my lips shut. But when he stabs at them with the end of the scissors, I can't help but part them. Lunk forces my jaw open. The scissors enter my mouth, and Sphinx begins to jab at my bottom incisors. He doesn't seem to have a plan other than chisel them out, with each thud of metal on bone. I can feel an electric jolt shoot through my jaw. The pain is undeniable. After a while, he opens the scissors up and begins prying at my teeth with them. He hones in on one tooth in particular, sandwiches it between the blades, and starts to saw at it. The pointed ends of the scissors dig into my gums as the blades grind on my tooth. I want more than anything to slip my hands out of my restraints and yank him off of me, if only for a moment of reprieve. But that wouldn't be a wise move. Not with Lunk holding my head. He could snap my neck in this position without so much as a second thought. Mercifully, a tooth comes loose. Sphinx snags it between his fingers, then wrenches it from my mouth. <laughs> Looks like I did you a favor. He laughs as he holds the tooth up to my face. You have a cavity! His hand stretches out for his gun on the table. Can't let him pick it up. If he does, I'm screwed. Out of desperation, an idea forms in my mind. I purse my lips together like an angel atop a fountain, spit a stream of blood, it catches Sphinx in the face, and causes him to drop his cigar. He jumps back, startled. After he wipes his eyes, he sees my gap tooth smile. I'm gonna kill you, I said. He snarls. You just earned yourself another tooth. Sphinx shoves his scissors back in my mouth. He's even more wild and reckless this time. I try to focus on anything else but the pain. The smell of tobacco in his breath. The look of rage in his eyes. Whatever will take my mind off what he's doing to me. The blades scrape against my gums and tongue, slicing up the inside of my mouth. He settles for a front tooth this time. Damn near snips it in half, but manages to rip it from my gums. I groan and gargle as blood pools in the back of my throat. It was tied till Herm's big mouth made it four to three, says Sphinx. He spins the wheel then tosses my teeth in the air, catching them in his hand. That's what I call a tooth for one. No, whoever loses this next round is going to get a snazzy new eye patch. I have two, so I don't have to see your junk anymore, asks Ty. Sorry, Ty, I say. Me too. He looks at me, and I can tell he means it. She wasn't worth it. It wasn't even the first time she cheated on me. Wish you and I settled things differently. I shouldn't have rolled over on you. Why don't you two shut up? Spouts Sphinx. He isn't happy when he's not the center of attention. It's only gonna get worse in these last rounds, boys. No Mr. Nice Guy. The ball rattles around the track, and when it stops, Sphinx laughs. 22! Red! Sucks to be you, Ty, he says. Ty sighs. I know he's tired. We both are. I want to tell him to hang in there, that I have a plan. But I can't draw more attention to myself, not while Lunk and Sphinx are distracted. Not while the gun is still on the table in front of me. How about one more gander at these bad boys for that soon-to-be-missing eyeball of yours, Sphinx says. He undoes his robe and shimmies in front of Ty. Lunk lowers the pointed end of the shears toward Ty's iris. He's screaming before it even pierces the lenses. But I don't blame him. While Sphinx and Lunk are fixated on him, I slip my right hand out of the restraints again. I pray that my three remaining fingers have enough strength and dexterity to untie my wrist. Pain pulses through my hand as I begin working on the knot, but I push it to the back of my mind. There's no time for that. Ty's screeching draws my gaze, and when I follow his voice, I see the scissors sticking out of his eye. Lunk twists the blades, impaling them deeper, scrambling the inside of his socket. I want to gouge my own eye out at the sight of it. But I have to stay focused. I won't have a better chance to get out of here. It takes longer than I would have liked, but eventually I manage to undo the other knot. With my free hand, I reach for the table. There's zero hesitation this time. Lunk removes the scissors from Ty's face. The remains of his eye hangs down the side of his cheek, a tangle of mutilated flesh and ocular nerves. That was fun! Cheers, Sphinx. Hey, asshole! I shout. I'm still standing in my chair. I didn't even bother to untie my legs, but that doesn't matter. 
They've got a gun, and they've got nowhere to go. Lunk and Sphinx whirl around, both faces wearing masks of blood and shock. I guess you didn't realize, I smirked. I'm left-handed. Lunk lunges across the table at me, but he has no chance. I squeeze the trigger and put a bullet in the center of his forehead. He collapses in a heap. The door opens, and in walks Karina, carrying a new drink and a service platter. She doesn't even notice Lunk on the ground until she closes the door behind her. I give her a bullet for her trouble, and the drink she's holding flies through the air before crashing to the floor. Sphinx makes like he's going to run, but I train the gun on him, and he realizes I'll shoot him down if he takes another step. I take my time to get the rest of me untied, then coax him into my seat. From there, I walk around the table and undo Ty's ropes as well. I peel the nipple off his forehead, put it in his pocket. You okay? I ask. He's in too much pain to hold a conversation, but he moans in what I can only guess is a reassuring tone as he nods to me. The two of us use the restraints to tie Sphinx up to the chair so he can't escape. What do you want? He says, money? How much is it going to cost to clear up this little dispute between us? Actually, I said, I was thinking we could play a little game of roulette. Ty picks the shears up off the ground. So here's the deal, I say. I'm going to spin the wheel ten times. Every time the ball lands on your color, my friend Ty is going to pick a body part of yours to amputate, mutilate, or grind a pulp. I pull open his robe and gesture to his pathetic manhood. This looks like a good place to start for round one. Wait, says Sphinx. Don't spin the wheel. We can talk about this. I lean down and give the wheel a spin. You're not really going to do this, he begged. I'll give you money. We laugh the idea off. The longer the ball rolls around the track, the more Sphinx begins to panic. It's fun listening to him ramble. What color? He shouts as the wheel begins to slow. His eyes dart back and forth between us. Well, what color am I? He's hyperventilating. Red or black? R red or black? The ball stops. I glance at Ty, then back at Sphinx. A smile crosses my face before I answer. Both. I want to remind you guys that I also do narrations over at Chilling. The Chilling app is available for Android, iPhone, and if you'd like to get your hands on the Chilling app and hear myself as well as many, many other narrators, and they have a whole new setup where you can watch movies on there now, and it's also free to try out with ads now, so you don't have to get a subscription like you used to before. You can actually just get the app, you can start watching, you can start watching on your PC. It's evolved so much since the last time I have updated you guys on this, and sincerely, it's a great place if you want to see more horror, especially if you like horror audio. So strongly, strongly suggest you check out the Chilling app. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Hummel, Diana Krause, Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sullyman, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.